name is John Golan, and I'm going to be presenting a brief summary on Israel's Levy fighter program with an emphasis on the engineering perspective of what went into this aircraft. So to give a little background about myself before I begin, I have been a designer, structures analyst, and engineering manager in the aerospace industry for over two decades now. I've participated in the design and development as well as field support for a variety of jet engines, both civil and military. And I've been published in a number of different magazine uh, news article venues over the years. The opinions expressed here again are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of my employers. I first studied the Levy as a graduate engineering student when I was a teaching assistant for a senior level airplane design class. And it's in my experience when you have to teach something, a subject to someone else, that's when you really learn it yourself. If you can explain it in enough detail that someone else can understand it, then you've mastered it. Now, the book that I wrote on the Levy, of course, has two components. It has the historical, chronological development cycle for the Levy, and it has the technical component, which is what's going to be discussed here. As an aerospace engineer, you are trained to see things differently. You're trained to recognize patterns in design, you're to recognize trades, and to see them on the basis of metrics, of values of what you expect to get out of those particular features, and not as arbitrary aesthetic choices or stylistic choices that might have been made. It was this perspective that brought me to eventually write about the Levy a subject which I concluded was inadequately covered by other books and venues to date. In order to gain some sense of perspective of different measurements that we're going to be talking about, it quite often helps to have something to compare it to. And it just so happens that there is a handy yardstick. There's the F-16, an excellent aircraft that was designed a little bit before the Levy and which it is often compared to. The two of them were contemporary designs but with contrasting design objectives and philosophies. The F-16 was designed as a lightweight air-to-air -air fighter. Now, in the 1970s, when the F-16 was first developed, the immediate antecedent, if someone was to ask you what was the best prior lightweight air-to-air -air fighter to refer back to, in the United States, that would have been Northrop's F-5E Tiger II. And like the F-5E, the F-16 was designed with a thin trapezoidal wing, one of many design choices that was made in their different trade studies. And the result is an aircraft with somewhat limited fuel capacity, but that's the trade that it made to arrive at the lightweight air-to-air -air configuration that they were ultimately aiming for. The Levy developers, on the other hand, had a different set of objectives. The Levy was developed as a strike jet. And if you want to know what was the best lightweight strike jet to look back upon from the 1960s or the 70s or the 50s, the one that stood head and shoulders above the rest was clearly the Douglas A4 Skyhawk. The Skyhawk was the reference point for how a lightweight design could be stretched to the limit. And like the Skyhawk, the Levy selected a delta wing design that provided a lot of fuel capacity. So whereas the F-16 relied on its wing tanks for about 19% of its total fuel volume, the Levy relied on wing tanks for about 54% of its total fuel volume. And there were a variety of reasons, again, other reasons why you might choose one particular wing configuration over the other, but in terms of fuel capacity, it meant that the Levy had volume available in the fuselage that it could use for other things like additional avionics, targeting, navigation aids, and so forth, which the F-16 had to utilize for fuel. And again, that was an outgrowth of some of the different emphases that were placed upon the two different designs. Now there were a number of reasons, above and beyond fuel capacity, why the Levy, like the A-4 Skyhawk before it, would gravitate towards a delta wing configuration. The delta wing, by its very nature, provides for a thicker root section 
And in the case of the Levy, this was enhanced even further by having the wing blend into the fuselage. Now, this thicker root section meant that the Levy wing spars had a greater height at the wing root. Now, the wing spars, which is what carries the load from the wing to the fuselage, the wing spars are effectively I-beams. And as any first-year engineering student will be aware, for an I-beam, the moment of inertia will increase with the height cubed, and bending stress will decrease with the height squared. So what this means is that by having a thicker root section, the Levy inherently had more load carrying capacity than it otherwise was, would have had it selected a thin trapezoidal wing such as the F-16. So by way of comparison, if you were to compare the Levy to say a Block 30 F-16C, which was the model that was in production when the Levy started its development cycle, the Levy was able to have a maximum takeoff weight that was 13% greater than the Block 30 F-16C, with an empty weight that was 10% less. Or if you want to look at another way and compare it to the Block 40 F-16C, which was the model that was in production right around the time the Levy program was canceled, relative to the Block 40, the Levy was able to achieve more than 50% combat radius advantage with an empty weight that was 20% less than the F-16C. And again, it all came down to its ability to carry more payload, more fuel, with less weight. So among the other choices the Levy developers had to make was whether and to what degree to incorporate composite components into their aircraft. Now ultimately, they chose a configuration that relied heavily upon composite structures technology. The Levy was 22% composite structure by weight. Um, this compares to around 2% for such preceding aircraft as the F-15 and F-16. Now the composites came with a price because uh, they were not cheap by any means compared to a conventional aluminum or titanium structure. However, they allowed for a lighter structural weight. They also, however, reduced drag and allowed aeroelastic tailoring to be employed. Now, aeroelastic tailoring meant that the anisotropic characteristics of the composites were leveraged such that when the wing structure bent and twisted under load, that the wing would resist the bend moment and conform to a desired preferable state for different portions of the flight envelope. For example, if you're in cruise, you want to have the best possible lift to drag ratio. If you're undergoing a high G maneuver, then the composites gave the ability to better resist the bending and twisting moments of that high G maneuver to give you extra lift, less drag, and therefore better performance. On top of this, the Israelis also incorporated semi-conformal carriage for their weapons, and they integrated the aeroelastic tailoring with the weapons carriage to reduce flutter for weapons that were stored under the wing, with the net result that they reduced storage drag by up to 50%. Again, all of these features that were aimed at extending the airplane's range and payload capabilities as a strike aircraft. Many individuals who are not in the aerospace industry and have not experienced what goes into developing a complex piece of machinery like this will assume that the features that they see are the result of some kind of a stylistic preference, that the inlet on the Levy, for example, which is a ventral inlet, was selected because it was similar to the F-16. In reality, it was selected on the basis of a whole series of design trades. So, in the case of the Levy Inlet, the developers at Israel Aircraft Industries looked at axisymmetric inlets, similar to what they used on the Kafir and the Mirage fighters before them, and they looked at side-mounted inlets with some kind of uh, shielded uh, configuration to improve airflow, and they looked at ventral inlets. And from the standpoint of providing 
less distortion to the jet engine, that's cleaner air, they concluded that both a side-mounted inlet and the ventral inlet offered superior performance over, say, the supersonic axisymmetric inlets of decades past. And many of the early concept studies for the Levy actually featured side-mounted inlets, something similar, for example, to what you'll see on the Gripen fighter today. Ultimately, for the Levy, the down selection between the two came down to structural weight. The ventral inlet was a lighter weight configuration, and for an aircraft that's dedicated to maximizing range and payload, reducing the structural weight became the overriding concern. A similar series of trade studies were carried out for the design of the vertical tail on the Levy. Both single and twin vertical tails were examined, and among the more unusual configurations was a twin vertical tail arranged in what was referred to as a tail boom configuration. Now this particular configuration was of somewhat interest because it offered some proved directional stability, that's control of the airplane, up to very high angles of attack. Typically for a conventional vertical tail, single or twin, that's mounted off of the fuselage, when the airplane goes to higher angles of attack, the wash from the fuselage tends to degrade the capability of the vertical tail to perform its function. By putting the vertical tail out on the tail booms, you could go to very high angles of attack and still have excellent directional stability uh, as a result of the, the tail. Ultimately, however, this configuration, although interesting, was discarded as being higher in weight than a conventional tail configuration mounted against the fuselage, and the Levy ultimately down-selected to a single vertical tail for that very reason. Among the Levy features that is most obvious in its design is that it is a canard configuration. And unfortunately, the canard is one of those features that is most commonly misunderstood by those outside of the industry. Canard designs actually fall into two very different families close coupled canards and long coupled canards. The close coupled canards intentionally leverage the canard wing interactions to improve the aerodynamic efficiency of the design. This includes designs such as the Levy, the Kafir, the Rafale, the Gripen, and the vast majority of canard fighter designs built to date. These kind of designs, you'll see the canard is located above and in close proximity to the wing. Long coupled canards focus on the superior control capabilities in high angle of attack that the canard affords. Examples include the X-31 and the Eurofighter Typhoon. For these configurations, the canard is located further from the wing to maximize the moment arm, which reduces the size of the canard and also reduces canard wing interaction. The Le Vie is a lightweight strike fighter that was intended to maximize its range, of necessity leveraged the canard configuration to achieve that effect, to maximize its aerodynamic efficiency, maximize its lift to drag ratio. And you can see it in the Levy design in the very close axial distance between the canard and the wing, and the fact that the canard is positioned above the wing. And if you look at the area of the canard on the Levy, it was the largest canard relative to the size of its wing of any fighter or prototype fighter design to have come out either then or since. And the result can be seen in the improved transonic performance of the Levy relative to its peers. Among the most important decisions that the developers of the Levy had to make was surrounding the size of the Levy, and integral to this was the engine selection. When the Levy was under development, there were originally three engine models that they had to choose from. The F404, the PW1120, and the F100. These three engines represented three different thrust classes from which to select. The Levy program was initiated using the F404 engine in February of 1980. However, its requirements 
outgrew that initial engine selection, and the engine was changed in May of 1981 to the larger PW1120. The effect of this was a 19% increase in combat radius for the aircraft using the same loading. Again, this was one of the most fundamental decisions to make. How big, how much payload, how far the airplane had to fly. While the Levy was intended to be a strike platform first, it also had a secondary air-to-air -air role. Now, trends in fighter performance can be gauged from some relatively simple comparisons for thrust loading or thrust to weight ratio and wing loading. And basically, kind of in the chart you see here, lower wing loading is going to lead to superior turn rate, and higher thrust loading will lead to superior acceleration. Now this is a relatively simple comparison. This is trends only because it omits aerodynamic contribution to both turn rate and acceleration. But it does give a general idea of what different developers were aiming for. And again, the design objectives were different between the Levy and the F-16. The F-16 was developed as an air-to-air -air day fighter with a secondary air-to-ground role. And the Levy was intended to be an air-to-ground strike fighter with a secondary air-to-air -air role. As a result of their different roles and emphases, the F-16 and the Levy approached their design space in a slightly different manner. The F-16 again grew out of the lightweight fighter experience of such predecessors as the F-5E, except incorporating a new generation of propulsion technology to give it a superior thrust-to-weight ratio, and leveraged its advantage in thrust-to-weight ratio in terms of its anticipated performance. As the F-16 evolved and had to take on additional air-to-ground roles, it added weight, which meant the wing loading kept going up. Now, new engine technology continued to be inserted, which meant that the thrust-to-weight ratio stayed pretty favorable, but the wing loading could not be resolved in a similar manner. The Levy, in contrast, started out from the experience of such air-to-ground platforms as the A-4 Skyhawk and the Kefir, and likewise, incorporating new engine technology sought a higher thrust to weight ratio but because of its long range strike role could not expect to see the same kind of thrust to weight ratio that the F-16 was able to attain. Instead, in order to give itself some advantage in some areas of the air to air flight envelope, it had to rely on its lower wing loading. By way of comparison therefore, we would therefore expect the F-16 to have a superior acceleration over the Levy due to its higher thrust to weight ratio. And we would expect the Levy to have a higher instantaneous turn rate as a result of its lower wing loading. And then of course, if you want to take another example, just as a point of comparison, you should expect that the Eurofighter Typhoon, which has an advantage in both wing loading and thrust loading, should have an advantage in both acceleration and turn rate over either the Levy or the F-16. But again, the Typhoon doesn't have the same requirements in terms of range and payload that the Levy had to deal with. A much more complete and thorough evaluation of jet fighter performance can be provided by something known as an energy maneuverability or EM diagram. The EM diagram provides a series of isocontours of specific excess power across a range of speed and altitude or of speed and turn rate conditions. And inherently it will include such effects as thrust loading, wing loading, and aerodynamic efficiency. The EM diagram allows us to compare the strengths and weaknesses directly of different aircraft and evaluate regions of the flight envelope where they have a relative advantage. Looking at the isocontours you will have regions where you have positive specific excess power, that is to say the airplane will be able to accelerate under those flight conditions, and regions with negative specific excess power, which is regions where the airplane will lose speed or lose altitude under those flight conditions. 
There will also be a contour where specific excess power is zero, and this will specify the maximum sustained turn rate for this particular aircraft at this speed and altitude combination and at this particular weight and drag condition. Now in order to prepare an EM diagram, you have to have some fairly extensive knowledge of the airplane. You need to know its weight. You need to know the engine performance, including speed effects and altitude effects. And you need a real drag polar that includes externals drag, Mach number effects, G-load effects. If you have these, however, this format gives you a much more complete picture than you will get from a simple comparison of wing loading and thrust loading, as was portrayed previously. To complete the evaluation for the Levy, an EM diagram was generated utilizing published data and is portrayed here in a lightweight air combat configuration. The drag polar was, of course, data matched from literature sources for canard configurations and Mach number effects, as well as G-loading effects. And engine performance in this particular example corresponds to maximum thrust or afterburning. What you can see from this particular example is you have speed or Mach number on the horizontal axis, turn rate on the vertical axis, and you also have typically in an EM diagram such as this portrayed in the background the contours for constant load factor or G loading as well as turn radius. Comparing again between the Levy and the F-16 on the basis of the EM diagram, there will be regions as anticipated where the Levy is projected to have an advantage in specific excess power, and those primarily correspond to higher turn rates. And there will be regions where the F-16 will be projected to have an inherent advantage in specific excess power, and those will be regions at lower turn rates. So effectively what it means is that flying one aircraft as opposed to the other, the Levy pilot would be prefer to engage his opponent in a turning contest, whereas the F-16 pilot would prefer to maintain his energy and not bleed off excess energy to maintain an advantage. So in summation, no single airplane can ever be all things for all roles. And the trades that go into an airplane will be reflected in its design. They will reflect the degree of air-to-air -air versus air-to-ground emphasis. They will reflect payload and range requirements. They will also re reflect budget and budgetary constraints. Requirements and priorities will be visible in the final product. The Levy was aimed at developing a lightweight, long-range strike fighter with a secondary air-to-air -air role. This was a very different emphasis from other aircraft at its time, and in its primary role, it far exceeded the capabilities of its peers at that time. The Levy was a unique story, built, developed in a unique age, and I've had time and space here to delve only a little into that history from an engineering technical perspective. I would encourage those who want to learn more to buy my book and to find out for themselves. Thank you.